welcome everyone. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. This is such a nice um, turnout for this program. And I want to give a special thanks to tonight's sponsor, the Keelan Family Foundation. Don and Veryl Keelan um, support a number of our lectures that fall under the history category. And um, for that, we are um, truly um, appreciative. Today's presenter is Chris Dant. He is a local writer and photographer who previously worked with the great landscape photographer Ansel Adams in Carmel, California. Dant's work has been part of exhibits in California where he taught photography for the Ansel Adams Friends of Photography workshops. In 2016, his black and white landscape photographs were shown in a juried exhibit at the Southern Vermont Arts Center. And at GMAL, Chris has previously given talks about Ansel Adams and most recently on um, iconic photographers and their works. We're very happy to have him back with us again. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. All right, well, thank you uh, everyone and uh, good evening and uh, actually very late evening for Germany and early afternoon for California. Um, as a photographer, I've always been interested in this man and I wanted to tell you his story. Um, and so tonight I'd like to bring you the remarkable story of a, a man in history, one that you may not have ever heard about, but one that lived large during the most remembered periods of this nation, the American Civil War. The men that fought in it and dealt with it were making history. They knew they were making history and it was one of the greatest adventures of their lives. The war made some people rich, ruined others, and ultimately changed forever the lives of all who lived through it. The war uh, became a tremendous inflection point in our country, one that would be written in the annals of history. But for the first time, one that would be recorded by a man who would give up his wealth and his fame and, in the end, his life and his mission to record it, that of uh, Matthew B. Brady. So let us begin. In October of 1862, just a few days after the single bloodiest day of fighting at Antietam in the American Civil War, when there had been more than 23,000 casualties in only 12 hours, Matthew Brady opened an exhibition of photographs at his New York gallery entitled The Dead of Antietam. The public flocked to the gallery because nothing has ever been seen like these in America before. There, next to the familiar roads and the fields and peach orchards of our homeland, were fallen young Americans, stiff, their arms outstretched, contorted, heaped in sunken roads or lined to the horizon in cornfields and in front of churches, all dead. Young men who had never restrained, strayed more than 20 miles from their own front doors now lay hundreds of miles from home, never to return. The public found the photographs repulsive yet fascinating. In them, they saw brothers, some saw uncles and sons, some even saw their fathers. The spectacular images were rapidly headlined in newspapers across America. One reporter noted, the dead of the battlefield come to us rarely, even in dreams. We see the list in the morning paper at breakfast, but dismiss its recollection with our coffee. Mr. Brady has done something to bring us the horrible reality and earnestness of the Civil War, and it is horrible. If he's not done something like lay bodies at our doorstep, he has done something very much like it. It is as if a funeral has happened in our front parlor. In his final years, Brady said, no one will ever appreciate what I went through to secure those horrible images. The world can never appreciate it. It changed literally the course of my life. The photographs became part of the great American journey, the astonishing details of a new war and destruction, but also of its presidents, its statesmen, famous authors and poets, and in the end, the death of our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln. Matthew Brady won eternal fame for advancing our knowledge of a new art form, the art form of photography, which drew men from afar to travel east to learn. They came from Ireland and Scotland, some from rural New England towns and farms, small villages, men who had little education and no training in the arts, and yet they strove to master a new and complex art form, 
that called daguerreotype, a photographic method that had just been invented in France. The invention could produce a magical image on a silver copper plate, like a mirrored painting that could be produced in minutes and yet would last forever. And with the new technique, they strove to influence and alter the course of history in the United States. During the mid to 1800s, the history was split in two parts, North and South, both with radically different cultures and ideals. Differences that would thrust the new nation into a great civil war and for the first time in history, the lives of these men, Timothy O'Sullivan on the left, Matthew Brady and Alexander Garner on the right, would intersect as they strive to show the world this shocking war in realism that would horrify families and loved ones, but give us for all time a record of one of the greatest struggles in American history. And if any one man could be called the father of this movement, the father of photojournalism, Matthew Brady would be that man. He produced thousands of images of the Civil War and struggled for fame and recognition with his competitors, and yet his struggle nearly ended his life and in the end thrust him into poverty and obscurity. In the annals of history, his work would become part of our permanent record, our national record, and influence historians and students alike. Even today, the journey that Matthew Brady took began not very far from us here, at least where I am. He was born in 1823 near Lake George, New York, so only 50 miles from here. Here he is pictured in a famous lithograph as a young man of about 22. But little is known about his early life. In 1839, he took a trip to Albany in search of a cure for his own eye inflammation. And there he met a man named Samuel F.B. Morris, who was a professor of art at the New York University. You probably recognize that name because 10 years later, Samuel Morse invented the electric telegraph and Morse code, which ironically would be a major part of the Union communication system that would help secure the Northern victory in the Civil War. But back then, Morse tutored, tutored Brady in the newly developed technology of daguerreotypes, the complex process of creating a mirrored image on a silver surfaced copper plate. Here we see some examples of uh, early daguerreotype photographs of Brady in the mid 1800s. Morse opened his own studio and offered classes and Brady was one of his first students. But soon Brady became the center of New York artistic colony, uh, colony that wished to study photography. And in 1844, he opened his new uh, studio where he began work to work as a portraitist. Publicized first in this famous image of him by the editorial Ed editorial cartoonist Thomas Nast. In his first portrait studio that was situated in New York at Broadway and 10th Street, seen on the far left, this is right where Grace Cathedral is today. It was called the National Portrait Gallery, as you can see on the left, and it was highly publicized. And Brady began to photograph as many famous people as he could in his goal to compile his daguerreotypes in a publication that he would later call a gallery of illustrious Amer Americans, 1850. The gallery featured many fam famous people I'll show you. And it's so very, very well. He also began using something called, it's a French invented a uh, thing called carte de visites, small, easily mailed visiting cards that rapidly became a popular novelty and millions that <clears throat> were sold in the United States and Europe, especially during the Civil War, as showing Union soldiers, even officers in camps and in the field. In his New York portrait gallery, the National Portrait Gallery, visitors would enter a reception room with this beautiful, spacious, furnished place with gallery of celebrity portraits. Ironically, we have now photographs of Brady's studio, but in this 1853 print, it shows the atmosphere of comfort and sociability that the tasteful reception room sought to create, where crowds of visitors admired Brady's daguerreotypes of celebrities hanging among its walls. It set customers at ease before they went into the studio for their portraits, requiring them to sit or stand for long periods and remain still before the camera, because in those days, the images, uh, when they were taken, uh, often could take up to a minute to expose. To prevent damage to the fragile daguerreotypes, uh, they would be sealed in small decorative cases with a protective glass cover, beautiful products that Brady had actually first manufactured. The surfaces of these daguerreotypes and later 
uh, its credits, it, it was replaced by the glass plate negative, were really quite fragile and easily damaged, which is why we see so much damage in some of them in the images I will show you. One of the earliest known daguerreotypes of Brady was taken early in his career. A very rare portrait of him as a young photographer that was encased in velvet in a leather case that he made. Likely only one or two of these exist today. It was taken about the same time as a lithograph I showed you earlier when he was in his 20s. In 1851, 48 of Brady's portrait daguerreotypes were exhibited at the Great Exhibition at London's Crystal Palace and his work received one of, very, of only five prestigious awards for daguerreotypes. And this is one of the ones he showed. He executed this portrait of his family as an example of a perfect daguerreotype showing his careful symmetry and lighting. This is Brady with wife Juliet on the left and her sister Ellen Brady Haggerty, a daguerreotype taken around the time of Brady's marriage. The photograph was likely taken by one of his new photographers, Alexander Gardner a man who would play a later a very pivotal and major adversarial role in his life. Another famous daguerreotype taken in 1852 depicted the highly famous Swedish opera singer, Jenny Lind. Jenny Lind was <clears throat> brought to America by P.T. Barnum of Barnum and Bailey Circus and Barnum Studio was directly across from Bailey's and they admired each other's successes. The incredible popularity of Jenny Lind and the many other notables on Brady's Wall made his gallery one of the city's most famous spectacles, and it really elevated him to celebrity status, and he soon became known as Brady of Broadway. And one had to make appointments well in advance to visit the famous Brady of Broadway, and even have to wait months to be photographed by him. Brady's work began to be noticed beyond New York, uh, the literary and entertainment there, and particularly down in Washington, where many politicians began to take notice of him, and soon they began to travel to New York to be photographed by Brady. His portraits, uh, particularly of, of many of these um, politicians, are legendary, and I'll show you a few of the famous ones. This is Daniel Webster, American lawyer and statesman who represented New York, uh, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts in the U.S. Congress. And he served under three or uh, uh, four presidents as the Secretary of State. In 1860, Queen Victoria sent her 18 year old son, Albert Edward, who is the Prince of Wales, on a goodwill mission to the United States. And while in New York, the Prince of Wales forced, uh, favored Matthew Brady and, and visited his um, gallery. And he was a Brady, immediately brought in for this portrait. This is American soldier and statesman Andrew Jackson, who was the seventh president of the United States. Before being elected to the presidency, Jackson gained fame as a general in the United States Army and served in both houses of, of Congress. This lovely portrait is James A. Garfield and his daughter Molly. Garfield was the 20th president of the United States, but was assassinated in 1881, only 200 days in office in Baltimore and he, had been, and he had been with Abraham Lincoln's eldest son, Robert Todd Lincoln, who was Garfield's Secretary of War at the time. Robert Todd became extremely upset when he witnessed Garfield's shooting from the memory of his own father, Abraham, who had been assassinated 16 years earlier. And ironically, Todd would be President William McKinley's assassination 20 years later. That made three presidents that he witnessed being killed. Robert Todd Lincoln, photographed here by Brady when he was 22 on the left and again some 10 to 15 years later in his 30s. He was the US Secretary of War and ambassador to the uh, United Kingdom. In his later years, Hilding here right here in Manchester was his beautiful home and until he died there in, in 1926 at the age of 82. This is Martin Van Buren, American statesman who served as the eighth president of the United States and a founder of the Democratic Party. And this tragic looking man is Edgar Allan Poe, known for his poem and tales of mystery and the macabre, such as the raven and the telltale heart. Poe was very unhappy with having to sit still and he fidgeted throughout the session. And when the exposure was finally successfully finished, Poe left abruptly and without comment. An alcoholic, Poe died just a month later, aged only 40. 
found drunk in a gutter in Baltimore, and he never saw this portrait. The great novelist James Fenimore Cooper, best known for The Last of the Mohicans, Brady claimed that Cooper told him he intended to put him into one of his novels, but he didn't live long enough to do so. This is Nathaniel Hawthorne, American novelist, dark romantic, and short story writer, most famous for The Scarlet Letter. Hawthorne was one of Brady's biggest supporters and bought many of these portraits from him. This is one of my favorites, Walt Whitman, American poet, essayist, and journalist, most famous for the poetry collection Leaves of Grass. Whitman was an outspoken critic of the Civil War. He volunteered under the Christian Commission and he consoled the sick and dying during the war and often wrote letters to their families. While in Washington to represent at the National Academy of Sciences in 1878, Thomas Edison sat for Brady with his newly invented phonograph, later known as the gramophone or record player. Just the year before, Edison had created the device, making him an overnight celebrity. This is Clara or Clarissa Barton, who risked her life to bring supplies and support the soldiers in the field during the Civil War. She founded the American Red Cross in 1881 at the age of 59, led it for the next 23 years. She sat for Brady right in the middle of her work in the Civil War. She came up to Washington to sit for him. This is George Armstrong Custer, a United States Army officer and cavalry commander first in the American Indian Wars. The Custer fought most famously in winning battles throughout the Civil War, particularly at Gettysburg and with Sherman during his march to the sea. He was President Lee's surrender to Grant at Appomattox. This famous man is Ulysses S. Grant, who led the Union Army as commanding general in the United States and was credited with leading the victory in the Civil War. Grant served as the 18th president and his portrait was taken in 1869 when he was first elected. This one is Stonewall, Thomas Jonathan Stonewall Jackson served as a Confederate general during the Civil War, probably one of the best known commanders after Robert E. Lee. During the, battle of, uh, the first battle of Bull Run, Jackson's brigade, which would henceforth be known as the Stonewall Brigade, stopped cold the Union assault and suffered more casualties than any other Southern brigade. Henceforth, Jackson had been known as Stonewall Jackson. After escaping from slavery in Maryland, Frederick Douglass became the national leader of the abolitionist movement in Massachusetts and New York, becoming famous for his oratory and anti-slavery writings. And this is Brady's most famous photograph of him. And another very famous image that I'm sure you've seen is Gordon, an African-American slave who escaped from Louisiana plantation. And after a harrowing 10 day journey, he found security among the Union troops at Baton Rouge. He joined the Union Army to make his people free and was examined by military doctors who discovered this horrific scarring on his back, the result of a brutal whipping by his overseer. This 1863 carte de visite is the only existing version known to have been produced by the Brady Studio, but it created a sensation when it was released to the public and quickly became the most powerful proof of slavery's brutality. While Abraham was de denigrated in his campaign early on as little more than a bumpkin in 1860, Brady's photograph of the beardless man in a smart suit helped give him a sophisticated look. This was the day that Union, uh, that Lincoln addressed a large Republican audience in a lecture hall at the Cooper Union in New York that significantly impacted American history. <clears throat> During the portrait session, <clears throat> Brady said, I had great trouble in making a natural picture. When I got before the camera, I asked him if I could arrange his collar. And with that, he began to pull it up. Ah, said Lincoln, I see you want to shorten my neck. Brady answered, that's just it and they both laughed. Brady is said to have said, Brady in the Cooper Union speech made me president. Brady's Lincoln portrait was then featured uh, on an engraving for the cover of Harper's Weekly, a journal of civilization, a very, very famous at the time uh, publication. And um, this is just before his presidency. It further elevated his status uh, in Lincoln's popularity. 
This is First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln in 1861. Brady said, from the first, I regarded myself under obligation to my country to preserve the faces of his, its historic men and its mothers. But Mary Lincoln didn't want her portrait taken. Yet she went through with it in the interest of national unity. Brady photographed Lincoln many, many times. Here he sat just before his presidency and just before the outbreak of the Civil War in early April of 1861. By that July, it was believed that Confederate troops were moving north and a battle would soon be fought somewhere near Washington and there were over 58,000 volunteer troops amassing. The young soldiers, now feeling their deployment was imminent, flocked to Brady's gallery. Every conceivable military dress was seen in the soldiers coming in for their carte de visites, portraits that they could mail home to their girlfriends and wives their mothers and fathers. Brady and assistant photographer Alexander Gardner worked daily for three weeks to finish the work. The portrait gallery had hundreds of young soldiers crowded around the gallery's block, all dressed in uniforms and laden with their rifles to have their picture made. This is a portrait of Francis Edwin Brownell from New York, a new recruit in the Union Army. These photographs were relatively easy for a photographer to make at the time and process and were in inexpensive for the average soldier uh, to have made and sent home. Sometimes he photographed casual scenes in camps like this near the city and it wasn't objected to. In 1861, photography was really uh, considered more of a harmless novelty. And until after the Battle of Bull Run, the war was also believed a novelty and there were a few restrictions. But with rumors of actors battles looming, his early photographs suddenly began to stimulate Brady's imaginative mind. And he thought that it could be for the first time in history that his great photography methods could record the war. And he began to think of how he could undertake such a daring attempt. After the bombardment of Fort Sumpner and before the first battle of Bull Run, Brady hatched his scheme. He hired a team of assistants, some of them are seen here, to travel the countryside in horse-drawn wagons filled with photographic chemicals and plates and cameras and dark rooms, and to get as close as the fighting as possible. The soldiers didn't understand them. He didn't understand what was happening, and they saw these wagons and called them what is it's wagons or what is it's. At the time, it was considered a novelty. Brady told a close friend. I really can only describe the destiny that overruled me by saying I felt that I had to go. A fair spirit in my feet said go and I went. He went to General Winfield Scott, chief of the army, and Scott was impressed with the idea and sent a letter to General McDowell about the value of recording the war in photography, who agreed to have him join his campaign. Even the new president agreed, but Brady would have to finance the venture himself. He trained 20 men along them, uh, the, Timothy O'Sullivan and Alexander Gardner. From his fortunes made in portraiture, he paid for the many horses and gear, the expensive pho pho photographic equipment, and he had some 30 very expensive wagons specially built for field work. And Brady was the director. Although the camera operation was important, the selection of the scene was to be photographed was just as important. And Brady was always by the heavy large camera setting the scene. Brady's eyesight had begun to deteriorate and many of the images in Brady's collection are thought to be the work of his assistants. And Brady was criticized for failing to document the work because so much of Brady's photography is missing such information. It's difficult to know sometimes not only who took the picture but exactly when or where it was taken. So on a blazing hot day in July 16th, 1861, Matthew Brady in a white linen duster and straw hat with a traveling darkroom, three days rations and several companions joined McDowell's army in the march on Centerville, Virginia, reported the position of the Confederate army. There was talk along the way that the war would be over in 30 days. The march was gay and the road filled with creaking wagons and brisk banner and laughter. The countryside was fantastic with brilliant banners and great uniforms. There was to be a big fight, it was announced in Washington, and the whole affair was marching armies, hundreds of civilians, sketch artists, members of Congress and their wives, pretty ladies in crinolines, side back on horseback, 
following an invading army. They carry parasols, lunch boxes with fine foods and wines, camp chairs, stools, and blankets. It really was more like a New England clam bake. And as one observer put it, and not the slightest exhibition of fear of uneasiness as to what might be in store for the brave fellows. But Brady rode forward with the advancing army and he soon found himself hot and dirty and dusty, sweating on the wagon seat. When the first skirmishes started, he spent a harrowing night in the rain. His, one of his wagons smashed or lost and some of his glass negatives destroyed and his life was threatened. At one point alone in the woods, a wandering soldier gave him a sword to protect himself. He found himself in the middle of a dangerous, miserable undertaking, a considerable change from the velvet carpeted photo salons where he had spent his days with the rich and famous. And in the end, over 4,000 soldiers would lay dead at Bull Run. And at the time, other photographers had the same idea as Brady. When the Civil War started, photography was increasing, prof increasingly professionalized. In the North, of course, Brady was just the first to organize a group of field photographers and the first to publish the war images. But in the first months of the war, Southern photographers actively documented the Confederacy through their own images. Here is Sam Cooley, photographer of the South. He was one of the most prominent. He's the fellow in the center with a straw, uh, the straw with, with a uh, bowler hat. The Union blockade, however, produced economic crisis and drove prices up, especially at a time when commodities are already scarce. And a prominent newspaper noticed soon, the photographic art down south has completely died out in the consequence of war. And we really don't have many photographs taken by Sam Cooley of the south. And also the photographic methods uh, were undergoing huge changes in the field. Although Brady had worked with daguerreotypes in his portrait studios, they just weren't possible to make in the field. So they invented a new technique, the wet plate negatives that were made on planes of glass that fit into the camera. Those were, became negatives and resulted in what is known as amber type prints and later albumin prints in which egg whites were bound to chemicals and paper, which resulted in increased details. And you'll see some of these in a minute. The albumin print became the predominant photographic process used by Brady and others. But the new process was extremely cumbersome on a battlefield. And when you go and take your next photograph with your smartphone, think about this. The techniques required two or more photographers to pour collodion on a clean glass plate, then sensitize the plate in the dark inside the tent in a solution of silver nitrate, extremely dangerous chemicals placed in the cupboard holder, the light sensitive plate would then be inserted in the wooden, heavy wooden camera. And that had to be, re and that was already pre-positioned and focused by the other photographer. The door on the camera would be opened, exposing the plate, and it would sometimes take many seconds to expose the image. Then the exposed pl plate was rushed to the wagon or the portable darkroom like this one seen here for developing and then fixing, all having to be done in minutes. The fragile glass plates had to be treated with great care after development, which was extremely difficult on a battlefield, and it was impossible to do in the rain. And inside the tent, it was hot, it was dangerous with toxic fumes, and in the summer, a burden with insects flying about. Civil War photographers couldn't even photograph direct battle scenes because it took so long to take, make the images. Then after the Union defeat at Bull Run, some alleged that Brady's large camera had terrified the recruits and they fled. One officer said it was the mysterious and formidable looking instrument that produced the panic because we mistook it for the great steam gun discharging 500 balls a minute and we took to their heels and they got, as they got into a focus. Early depictions of the Civil War had really been more elaborate scenes like this one a lithograph from Bull Run. Artists would present the war by glorifying generals, showing endless expanses of perfectly formed armies, recording the single heroic gesture that altered the course of the battle. Families in the North had fathers and brothers. They had husbands and sons, all loved ones fighting in these battles. And their only perception of the events of the war came from such paintings in the few letters that they would receive. And the letters from the front gave them only 
more lighthearted events, downplaying what the soldiers really saw and experienced. But Matthew B. Brady and his photographers showed in the stark photographs the real war with the tragic and horrible scenes of the battlefield. It told families back home, the war was not far away. It was not an abstraction, but as a real event in time, close by, frightening. Here, Confederate lay dead on Matthews Hill of Bull Run. Brady had hiked these Virginia hills in his younger years, and he later said, it was so shocking to see the dead men scattered along the trail as if they had just fallen where they had stood. It was so hard to believe what we really saw. Brady had accomplished the unthinkable, however, forging into battle laden with a heavy camera and having to avoid shells and bullets in a stampede. Brady came under direct fire after the Battle of Bull Run. He also got, nearly got killed at Petersburg and Fredericksburg. And in Bull Run, he lost one of his cameras and equipment, and it foreshadowed how expensive it would be to cover the war. And Brady and the Army commanders knew by the fierce fighting and the many casualties, this war was going to be much longer and bloodier than they thought. Here, he photographed a Confederate massacre in a ditch beyond a stone wall that had been attacked from behind by Union forces. From these photographs, Brady's reputation now became cemented. He returned from Manassas, Virginia to his gallery in New York and posed for this photograph that's well known, wearing his field costume and his straw hat. He sent out the photograph about Washington and soon the national paper read, the public is indeed indebted to Brady of Broadway for his numerous excellent views of grim visaged war. He has been in Virginia with his camera and spirited are the pictures he has taken. His are the only reliable records of Bull Run. And this was the beginning. Brady received official permission to continue his, his efforts. He wrote, I finally secured permission from Stanton, the Secretary of War, to go to the battlefields with my cameras, all financed by myself. So nearly a year after Bull Run in 1862, he trained and organized photographers assigning them to different theaters. And by August of that year, he had 35 bases of operations. He later boasted, I had men in all parts of the army like a great newspaper. For them, it was a triumph of courage and technical skill to stand near the thunderous carnage of the war and try to record it using difficult and unwieldy photographic methods that I told you about. There were long exposures and clumsy instruments operating out of a moving darkroom that was visible to all but the results speak for themselves. The Civil War remains vivid in our visual understanding because it is so well photographed. The New York Times wrote that Brady almost laid the war dead at our doorstep, it is so close. And at last, someone has captured the terrible reality and earnestness of this war. Many of the dead soldiers were found clutching the very photographs that Brady had made of their loved ones earlier. And those who survived again and again turned to Brady's photos to recall what they had lived through. Brady photographed famous generals and common foot soldiers, lovers and wives back home. And he innovated relentlessly, taking pictures from balloons, using stereoscopic images for 3D images. And slowly the generals understood the value of the documentary record that these men were creating. But then, as I mentioned, there were others who had, he had hired who were trying to make it on their own. This is Timothy O'Sullivan, an Irish American who was employed by Brady. And when the Civil War began in 1861, he was commissioned as a first lieutenant in the, in the Union Army and took photographs for them. Alexander Garner, particularly a photographer for Brady, and as Brady's eyesight began to fail, he put Garner in charge of his Washington, D.C. gallery. Garner has often had his work misattributed to Brady. And also, despite his considerable outputs, historians had tended to give Garner less than full recognition for his documentation of the war. Thus, with Garner and Sullivan, O'Sullivan, uh, and photographic coverage of the war became extensive. But they didn't photograph just the war dead. Northern military leaders recognized the value of photographs as aids to map makers and construction engineers. And here's Garner photographing two pontoon bridges over the Rappahannock River used in the Battle of Fredericksburg. 
Here is a 13-inch mortar dictator mounted on a railroad flat car near Petersburg, Virginia. The photographers also smuggled photographs from the South to document Confederate activity. Here it showed Confederate torpedoes and shot and shells in front of the Charleston Capitol that gave Union valuable intelligence. But the public was taking most notice of the dead that were scattered in the battlefield after the war. Here is Gardner's very famous shot of rebel artillery dead during the Battle of Antietam. A huge challenge for Garner and also for Brady was that satisfying the curiosity of the public by making the horrors of war visible without undermining the faith in the cause. And one way they achieved this was to present their pictures in bound form, giving the photographer an opportunity to narrate their thoughts and feelings in each image. So in 1863, Garner published this photographic sketchbook of the war. He had been offended actually by Brady's habit of obscuring the names of his field operators behind the credit by Brady. Garner specifically identified each of the 11 photographers in the publication, but gave no recognition to Brady and some of Brady's photographs are in it. It was viewed as one critic as really only a sketchbook account full of digressive and disconnected photos and musings that spoke to the limited photographer's experience and really not the war. It didn't sell well, but these did. These are Brady's published several band versions of his photographs. One was published during the war by the War Department, which contained many famous images of Brady. Another later edition contained photographs along with those of Gardner. They were very vivid, well written, and the book sold quite well, and they're still for sale today. So Brady was really the favorite photographer of the war. People in the North still flooded his New York and Washington studios where they could view the actual images of war of the fallen soldiers. And at that time, the illustrated newspapers became wildly popular because there was no way to reproduce photographs in the new newspapers in the 1860s. Sketch artists became quite well known and duplicated photographs in using woodcuts to reproduce the images. Newspapers were numerous and some of them had written based on political affiliation. Harper's Weekly was such a popular paper. Neither photographer nor sketch artists were really ever entirely objective. While Brady and Gardner and their compatriots had said their photographs held a unique claim to objectivity and thus to historic significance. They were thoroughly implicated in the Union political project and were used heavily to further the Union victories. The camera's viewfinder had become a political instrument. One newspaper published an article on the moral responsibility of war photographs saying, photography awakens the sympathies of a whole people in the glorious revenge of good against evil. And another reporter of the war wrote, the correspondents of the rebel newspapers are sheer truth falsifiers. The correspondence of the Northern journals can't be relied upon entirely, but Brady never misrepresents the truth with these photographs. Then in the spring of 1863, when Lee's army turned up in the Shenandoah Valley to invade the North in Pennsylvania, word got out that the war's tide was going to turn and photographers knew something was going to happen. In July of that year, Union and Confederates clashed violently at the town of Gettysburg, seen here taken by Garner and O'Sullivan who arrived early to record the scene. Garner arrived after one of the big battles, shown in his book, the photograph entitled A Harvest of Death Union soldiers lie face up, their stomachs bloated, their pockets picked and their boots stolen. Garner wrote the blank horror and reality of war in opposition to its pageantry. Let us aid in preventing ever such another calamity falling upon our nation. And Garner was then driven to get as many photographs that could gain public attention and further his fame. Here's a shot of the burial crew at Gettysburg. These were spectacular, but in Garner's rush to publish the horrors of war, he began to cut corners and staged some of the photographs. In this photograph of Confederate soldiers, one of the so-called dead began showing up in more than one of his photographs and was later found to be one of the Garner's staff who posed on the field as dead. 
And there were several photographs of the same man lying in different positions, even in different locations. Likely, again, one of staff of Garner's. And this is Garner's most famous image called Home of a Rebel Sharpshooter. And he wrote in his book, the sharpshooter had waited for a clear shot at the enemy and told us he was taken out by a violent shock of a bullet and was killed in his den. It was later shown to be a fabrication. The same soldier was photographed earlier in another spot on the left. And to make the shot more spectacular and create a better composition, Garner and his assistant literally dragged the dead soldier on a blanket 40 yards to a more dramatic surrounding at the, at the cove in Devil's Den. Garner rolled the body to face the camera, added props to make him look like a sharpshooter. But what he didn't realize that the rifle was an infantry rifle, but not a sharpshooter's rifle, and they identified it as such. However, the photograph became a big favorite with the public showing the rebel dead in his den, but it had been later found to be staged. But then Brady arrived at Gettysburg a week after Garner and photographed the empty fields after the dead had been removed and buried. Garner's style was journalistic and sensational. Brady's was artistic. He had already received, received attention from his photographs at the dead of Antietam. They now were far less dramatic than Garner's and in several Brady posed for his assistant and here Brady stands by a pond in the foreground before a split rail fence uh, called the wheat field in which General John F. Reynolds was shot. Then the other photo on the right bears a similar caption. Brady stands wearing a signature straw hat on the right and his assistant who points to the woods where General Reynolds fell. At the time, General Reynolds was a very beloved Union general that was shot from his horse. Even without knowing that this was Brady himself, the viewer would know this is a distinct individual contemplating the horrible scene that had taken place within the camera's viewfinder. And it was viewed by the public as a relief by the finality of battle. People were just simply sick of seeing photographs of dead soldiers. And this was one of Brady's most famous photographs of the Civil War, three captured Confederate soldiers, likely from Louisiana that posed casually on Seminary Ridge in the aftermath of the Battle of Gettysburg, seemingly relieved, yet defiant. They wore only clothes from home and not uniforms. The photograph illustrated the skill that Brady brought in posing for the portraits, from the, but these were rebel soldiers in a Gettysburg in a battlefield. Yet despite the misgivings about Garner's questionable photographs at Gettysburg, he had already established name for himself before that point at Antietam. And I wanna show you a few of his photographs. This is the most famous one of uh, Lincoln in the center with Alan Pinkerton, which is the um, person that actually invented the Secret Service on the left. And then General Major, um, Major General John A. McLernan who was a close friend of Lincoln's and a political ally. Ironically, McLaren was made famous by this handsome portrait of him and by Brady in 1863. Garner also photographed Lincoln as he towered over George McClellan and his men near a battlefield of Antietam in 1862. And you can see them in the center there. The next day, Garner took this well-known photograph of Lincoln seated in the tent with McClellan. Garner situated the commander in chief slightly forward of McClellan and asked Lincoln not to gaze directly at him. Garner's plate had snapped in half when it was developed, sending the crack right through McClellan. Ironically, as we'll see later, it wouldn't be the first time this happened. It's something that war historians find oddly foretelling. McClellan was finished. This was the moment Lincoln decided to end the general's command. Then, not long after that photograph was made, Garner photographed this Union commander in his camp, who was later shot multiple times with musket balls that mimicked the paths of the cracks in the photograph. And as we'll see, the cracked image of Abraham Lincoln would be Garner's most famous and most eerie. Then Brady returned to Pennsylvania for the dedication of the Soldiers National Cemetery in Gettysburg on uh, November 19th, 1863, four and a half months after the Union armies defeated the Confederacy there. 
He made this photograph, the original uncropped photo of the speaker's stand at Gettysburg, and had planned more when Lincoln gave his Gettysburg address. Nearly a hundred years later in the 1950, in the 1950s, Josephine Cobb, the chief of the still photo section at the National Archives discovered this crack plate negative and recognized it as Gettysburg on the day of the dedication as a national cemetery. Cobb bet that Lincoln would be in that photo. The tremendous detail of the large glass plate negative allowed her to identify individuals and they searched the area of the red square most likely where he might have been. And this is a blow up of that. It shows Lincoln facing the crowd, not wearing a hat, just down from the flag. The photo was taken at noontime, about three hours before Lincoln delivered his famous address. And so Brady relaxed for a while, thinking he had plenty of time to get in closer and prepare his camera once the address began. But Lincoln's talk was just 10 sentences and only two minutes, and Brady missed the shot, making this and the first and only photograph of Lincoln at Gettysburg. Then in December of 1864, Sherman arrived in Savannah, Georgia, and from there he burned his way southward to Atlanta, ending the Confederacy and ultimately the Civil War. Brady and Alexander both documented the march to the sea. Here the Confederate capital of Richmond is stands in ruins. A Union wagon train enters the strongholds of the Confederacy in Virginia in the early spring of 1865. And here, Union soldiers uh, sit by the Confederate cannons captured a fort and a captured fort in Atlanta. However, Brady did provide us with this now fame, I'm sorry, um, but ironically, the other photographers were so focused on the end of the war that they missed this the true end of the war. On April 9th, 1865 at Appomattox Courthouse, Lee surrendered his Confederacy to Grant and the Union armies. And we have no photographs of that most important event of the war, only such artist rendering of the event. But Brady did provide us this, this now very famous and very handsome portrait of Robert E. Lee in Richmond. General Lee was reluctant to pose for any photograph after the war, but Brady had known the general since the Mexican War and Mrs. Lee thankfully convinced her husband to have the portrait made. He stands proudly on the porch of his home in Richmond, a home now restored as the Stuart Lee House. Brady took the portrait April 16th, 1865, just one week after Lee surrendered his army to Northern Virginia to General Grant in just two days after Lincoln was assassinated. He wore the same new uniform he had worn it for his meeting with Grant. The 58-year-old general poses proudly, seemingly unscathed. This would be Brady's last wartime photograph. Brady also had photographed William Tecumseh Sherman to pose for this beautiful triumphant shot in Atlanta. Luckily, the crack in the plate had missed Sherman also, shortly after the war ended, Matthew Brady was asked by the War Department to again photograph Sherman, is shown here in the center with his arms folded along with all of his generals. But the big story was that of Ulysses Grant, the man responsible for the stunning Union victory. Brady photographed, uh, focused on Grant and photographed him many times, and here he is in the center with his hands in his pockets with his other generals and staff in, camp, in a camp in Virginia. During the war, Lincoln had summoned Grant to Washington to award him the three stars of a lieutenant general. And when the news broke out that Grant was on his way, Harper sent a telegram to Brady to get his portrait. But Brady already had several of Grant, but he decided this time that he needed a new one. And on March 8th, 1864, when Grant's train rolled into Washington, Brady was at the station, allowed to accompany him to the White House for the commission, and then was whisked off to his studio for the portrait. In Brady's studio, there was a skylight that was used for the lighting and Brady sent his assistant up to the roof to draw back the mats to uncover it. But the man slipped, his foot plunged through the skylight, sending glass shards flying straight down onto Grant, who calmly just moved out of the way. I mean, after all, this was nothing compared to what he had seen in battle. And he laughed afterwards that the public might think a plot had been formed to assassinate the new general. And this was taken the moment after the glass showered down on Grant. 
the portrait was the best taken of him, showing a serious man, carefully groomed, youngest in appearance despite the war's dresses. But clearly the prize was Lincoln. While the president had sat for Garner several times, his favorite was Brady, who took many portraits during the war. Here he is in 1863 in a studio, and then again in 1864, a portrait that was used for the cover of a our current $5 bill. And finally, this lovely portrait of Lincoln with his son, Tad, as the war ended, showing Lincoln worn and tired. After the Civil War, when Alexander Garner and Matthew Brady were now both famous photographers and locked in fierce competition, the biggest story of the century happened the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, and then their competition intensified. Brady, hoping to rekindle this wartime photographic magic and Garner, his former understudy in making a name for himself, raced against each other to Ford's Theater where Lincoln was shot, to the autopsy table where John Wilkes Booth was identified, and to the gallows where the conspirators would be hanged. And whoever could take the most sensational or ghastly photograph might achieve fame. To begin with, there's this famous Garner portrait of Lincoln taken March 1865 near the end of the war. It shows Lincoln confident of victory and looking forward to binding up the nation's wounds, as he said. Lincoln is exhausted and the lines in his face are etched deep, but there is nonetheless a small enigmatic smile. But as Garner was developing this plate, it cracked right through. He still brought out the image and made one print, but he threw out the glass plate, thinking Lincoln would just come back for another portrait sitting, but the appointment never happened. The president was soon assassinated, and this was the last portrait ever taken of Lincoln before his death. The image shows a crack through the president, foreshadowing the bullet that would soon pass through Lincoln's head just a month later. The original of this is <clears throat> print sits at the National Portrait Gallery in Washington. April 14th, 1865 was a good Friday. Everyone in Washington was in a celebratory mood at the end of the war. A victorious grand army marched up Pennsylvania Avenue. Here photographed by Alexander Gardner. Lincoln himself was thought is going to celebrate and he planned to attend Ford's Theater that evening. But his assassination that night threw a massive chaos in the immediate post-war celebration. Harper's Weekly published this, the, the imagined drawings of the horrible scene, an event that threw Brady into a frenzy to document the crime of the century. But Alexander Garner was already making plans of his own. Edward Stanton, the Secretary of War, needed photographs. The assassination of Lincoln moved him to find and publish the likely, likely perpetrator of, this, of the crime, John Wilkes Booth, and he wanted images of the most wanted man in America. The suspected assassin, a well-known actor at the time, had this photograph made some years earlier by Alexander Garner and was used by the Secretary of War. Now Garner was in Washington while Brady was still in Richmond photographing Robert E. Lee. And with Brady gone, Garner had a head start to capture the story of the century. He raced to Ford's theater after the assassination and took this photograph, black lace draped across its brick facade and guards stationed outside while men on the right loitered in front of the attached star saloon, a saloon where Booth and Lincoln's bodyguard both drank whiskey the night before. Stanton, the war secretary, wanted Garner to photograph the interior of the presidential box where Lincoln had been shot. The photographs, photographs would be useful at a trial if they caught the man. Instead, Brady's cameraman was there and allowed inside to take this photograph of the aftermath before Garner could arrive. The rocking chair still sits at the right box where Lincoln had sat when he, when he was shot. And then upon jumping from the theater box, Booth caught his leg on the draped flag on the right and fell to the stage, breaking his leg. Garner never got a usable shot of presidential Booth. But he did photograph Lincoln's funeral as it moved down Pennsylvania Avenue, April 19th. Then, by April 26, federal soldiers tracked down Booth at the Garrett Farm in Virginia as he was trying to escape to, Virgin to Mexico. 
with Booth trapped inside a burning barn. Sergeant Boston Corbett, shown here, shot and mortally wounded him. Corbett then became a hero, and Brady got this portrait and sold the image as a carte de visite. The photo had wide sail, but this really would be the last victory Brady would have of a rival Gardner and Chase for the Lincoln conspirators. Booth's corpse was taken to the Monitor Montauk and Alexander Gardner was called in to identify his corpse and photograph him. Gardner took one shot of Booth and the plate and print were whisked off to the War Department and shown to Stanton. There was only, being only one print made, but shortly thereafter, the photo was never seen again. The War Department was determined to make sure Booth was not made a hero and Stanton destroyed it. Booth was then secretly taken and lowered into a hole beneath the old Arsenal Penitentiary in an unmarked grave. Alexander Garner would soon arrive at the Arsenal, but his aim was not at Booth's grave, but the fate of his fellow conspirators. America now is in the pursuit of swift retribution. By order of the Secretary of War, the hanging of the four condemned conspirators was to be photographed by Garner, who first took these mug shots before their execution. David Harold, who helped Booth <clears throat> plot the assassination and help him escape. Lewis Powell up in the upper right, who helped uh, to assassinate, the, tried to assassinate the Secretary of State Seward. Mary Surratt, a Confederate sympathizer and owned the boarding house where Azarat and Bow, Powell and Booth often met. And Joe's Aserat, who was to kill Vice President Johnson, but ended up losing his nerve. Gardner was the only photographer allowed into the Washington ar arsenal to take photographs. He created a series of very famous images with two cameras, as if he were going to film a movie. Here's the empty scaffold moments before the execution on July 7th, 1865. Then the reading order of the execution as the conspirators had white hoods and nooses placed by, around their necks by four Secret Service officers. They were walked to the hinged platform. An official clapped three times and the platform collapsed under them. Garner's final shot just as the condemned fell. The Northern newspaper headline said, we want to know their names no more. The photographs were published in the July 22nd issue of Harper's Weekly. He made thousands of carte de visites, but nobody wanted them now in his dream of becoming famous from these photographs faded quickly. The revolution of Garner's execution series went unnoticed completely until well after his death in 1882. With the war and the assassination behind them all, Brady then tried to return to the portrait business, but his eyesight grew worse and he couldn't afford this, to hire any photographers. Worse, the public had forgotten the war and the death of Lincoln, and nobody really wanted to see photographs of the dead. And as he grew old, he began to fail. This is the last portrait taken of Brady by his nephew in 1889 when he was 66. Brady had paid out more than $100,000 of his fortunes at the time. That's more, that's almost nearly $3 million today to create this archive of war photographs. And he expected the government to buy nearly the 10,000 plates, but it became clear after Appomattox that he would never recoup his fortunes. He desperately tried to sell the images and the cost of storing them began to strip his dwindling resources and it sat withering in a studio seen here. Creditors claimed some of the archive, but in 1875, the United States government bought most of it, but for only $25,000, thanks to the efforts of a congressman at the time named James A. Garfield, a future president and the man he had photographed. He was forced to sell his New York City studio in 1873. He remained deeply in debt. He had been a wealthy man and a household name at the beginning of the Civil War, but he was now broke. He left for Washington with his wife where they took up a modest residence, but he was depressed by his financial situation and loss of his eyesight. And then not long after, he was devastated by the death of his wife and he began to drink heavily. Then in 1895, he moved back to New York in a small one room apartment, really only minutes away from the lavish National Portrait Gallery seen here on Broadway. This is a place he had photographed presidents and statesmen, but now he had no friends or family to help him through his despair. And his world 
literally collapsed. The war that would eventually etch his name in the annals of history had destroyed him. And while he tried to revive his name with a talk on the Civil War in the fall of 1895, he grew worse. And just after the new year in 1896, Matthew B. Brady died penniless in a charity ward of the local hospital at age 73. He was buried at Congressional Cemetery in Washington. In the years following his death, the photographs had been <clears throat> he had produced acquired a life of their own as they moved from one holding area to the other before finally settling at the home of the Still Pictures Division of the National Archives in College Park, Maryland. Many of the images made their way to the National Portrait Gallery, to Harvard University, and to the Library of Congress. Matthew Brady's death did not go unnoticed. Newspapers throughout the United States ran the news the next morning. The Washington Evening Star said Brady was a household name all through the nation and a great photographer. Another newspaper column said in person and manner, Brady was the most congenial gentleman. His friends were legion, his photographs were legendary. Brady in a studio had produced over 10,000 plates. And although some were broken, lost or destroyed, several hundred of glass plates were sold to gardeners not for the image that they held, but for the glass themselves. And in the years that followed Appomattox, the sun slowly burned Brady's images of war from thousands of greenhouse glass plates. Fortunately, 15 years later in 1911, Eaton's publishing company used most of his negatives to publish a prominent collection of Brady's Civil War photographs as the phot Photographic History of the War, a 10-volume collection, which sold well and is still for sale in auctions. Today, much of our understanding of the Civil War comes from these photographs. And his legacy would be endured from his portraits of Lincoln, which are on our current $5 bill. I showed you the original. And Penny. Even during his lifetime, his portraits were used for the national bank note, for the $10 note, and in a grade on the 90 cent Lincoln postage stamp of 1869. Matthew Brady had photographed every president from John Quincy Adams to Grover Cleveland. He witnessed the horror of the Civil War and knew well the men who shaped America through it. He nearly lived to see the next century, which would be built on the photographic media he so strongly helped to advance. While his headstone had to be paid for by others, it was small compared to the man he photographed and his name was etched into the stone of history. His life arc had moved from poor immigrant to celebrated artist, then to photographic historian, to wealthy businessman, and finally to destitute icon. And in the end, Brady's own story was embodied in a title he often used in his advertisements to lure soldiers into his studio before they went to the battle. That he said, you can never tell how soon it may be too late. Today, Matthew B. Brady's legacy is commanding. He left us many historical portraits of America's great artists, great poets, presidents, and statesmen. But more importantly, he left us a major photographic record that documented every aspect of the great Civil War. And most importantly, he advanced photography for others to develop. And as he lay near death, he said, my greatest aim was to advance the art of photography and to make it what I think I have, a great and a truthful medium of history. And I say, I, I believe that this is more true today than ever in our country. Thank you. That's it. Okay, great. Oh. Well, thank you. <laughs> That was, that was fascinating. And um, I was amazed at the number of famous people he had photographed. So we have some uh, questions here um, from, uh, let's see, Alec. He says, do you know how he got a picture of Stonewall? Well, um, because, the, uh, because the Confederate uh, photographers were not working anymore, uh, after the war, he was allowed to photograph Stonewall Jackson. Um, he came up to a studio. Uh, there was no uh, arrest warrant for him or anything. And he was allowed to sit in a studio for, um, for a portrait. During Lincoln's second inauguration, there were many photos taken. Some show Booth's conspirators in the front row near the stage where Lincoln was. Do you know if Brady or Gardner 
um, Gardner took the photo. I believe Gardner took the photo of the second inaugural address and Booth was in that photograph at the very top. I don't know about the conspirators being there. I never heard that, but I do know that Booth was in that photograph. And at the time, I can tell you that Booth had thought he was going to kidnap the president instead of assassinate him. But um, there was a, some secret service near him and he thought better of it. Is there an internet site with collected photographs? Yeah. Um, if you go to the Library of Congress uh, and also the National Portrait Gallery and you type in Matthew Brady, you'll find many of his photographs and you can see them in high resolution. When were the, when were the first, first photographs taken? Which year? When were the first photographs of what? I'm sorry. Uh, Brady's photographs, I believe. When were the first photographs taken? Which well, year? yeah, his first photographs were daguerreotypes taken uh, you know, in uh, approximately the 1845, 1850 period, I showed you some of the early daguerreotypes he took. And his portrait that I showed you, the rare portrait of him, was one of the first. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Fantastic history and phenomenal presentation, uh, says Kim. Who were Brady's detractors? Were there any? And what types of criticisms were there of him? Yeah. Well, that's a kind of a complex uh, question. Um, if you read books, I've read a couple of books by Brady, you, you will find very different interpretations of him. One school of thought is that, well, Brady really didn't take many of these photographs at all. He just had his, uh, had his wartime correspondence and people like Garner and O'Sullivan and many, many others take them and he just took credit for them. That's not exactly true. Um, probably Gardner was his biggest proponent or, uh, and, and really didn't like him because he often got uh, his photographs misattributed to Brady because Brady would just stamp by Brady on the photograph and publish it. Um, and, um, but as I mentioned, uh, Garner for, uh, falsified some of his photographs. And later, and they didn't know it at the time, but later he became very unpopular because of that. Despite the fact that he photographed, uh, you know, the, the end um, when Lincoln was killed and uh, the conspirators. And of course, Secretary of War Stanton really liked Alexander Garner um, and allowing him to take uh, photographs of the execution. But I would say uh, there, there was there, you know, he got um, some heat in the uh, in the in the in the uh, newspapers um, <clears throat> for some of the photographs that he took and misattribution to the photographs with other people. So I think, uh, you know, there were over 25 photographers working in the, in the field um, at the time. So there was a bit of a competition and some um, unhappiness among them. Okay, I have a question from Janet. Was the method Brady developed to take photographs on the battlefield an important contribution to the technological advancement of photography? And did he make any other technological contributions to his art? The, um, the glass plate negatives that I mentioned, which were the main way they made the images, uh, were not Brady's invention. They were actually uh, developed uh, before. Uh, <clears throat> and, um, but Brady helped to advanced that technique that had been started um, and discovered new ways of making prints. He particularly was um, good at figuring out uh, more and more. I think you could see in some of the photographs and you know, as the years went on, the photographs were clear. Um, you could see it in the, in the image of, um, of Garfield in particular. The, the, uh, he did develop um, a lot of the techniques but he didn't write them down. I mean, his main force was photographing the war and documenting that. The actual techniques uh, that he used had been written, but they weren't ever published. Um, but many photographers, he taught many photographers who came up to Washington to learn from him. So he did teach them verbally and, you know, by, by example, but he never actually wrote a book about it or did anything to, but he was not credited for uh, coming up with a new method. 
new message? Um, there was a, que a question very early on um, during the presentation. Um, it was about 45 minutes probably into your presentation. And the question is, was that a shot of the US Capitol building under construction during the Civil War? And I'm not sure. I don't think I showed a photograph of that. Um, okay. It was under construction. Um, the dome of the, of the Capitol was actually still being constructed when uh, Lincoln was uh, first elected president. Um, I think you might have been referring to a photograph of uh, the march down Pennsylvania Avenue. I don't recall whether it showed the Capitol, but it was being constructed at the time. We do have a comment. Unbelievable and riv riveting, terrific presentation. Um, and I would certainly agree with that, Chris. Um, whoops, wait. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, sure. Does any of his equipment survive? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't know for sure. That's a very, very good question. Um, I know that his large wooden cameras did survive for a long time. Uh, but I really don't know what became of them. I mean, most of the focus from Brady was on his negatives uh, and his prints. Um, of course, the equipment, uh, you know, they're, interestingly now, so I don't know where his original cameras were, and there were more than certainly one. There was probably 30 made uh, that Alexander Gardner used, that Timothy O'Sullivan used, and many others. And I would guess somewhere there are some of those uh, original, uh, very large, heavy wooden box cameras in somebody's collection, but I I have to look that up. Um, you know, it's 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 very interesting because, uh, um, you know, there are still photographers today that use those cameras, those types. They build them and they actually go into the field. I saw a whole video of somebody actually trying to recreate the whole scene on a battlefield using the glass negatives. I mean, he, he became proficient at it, but he said, man, this is one of the hardest things you could possibly do even in calm times. And you can imagine uh, what was going on around him. So um, yeah, anyway, I think that mostly the negatives in prints are the ones they focused on, but those, those, those are probably in existence somewhere. I can't imagine that people would have thrown them away. Uh, how about the lenses? That yeah, is those lenses were made uh, in Europe. They were they were really expensive. They were these big, huge brass lenses, and and they were different, and they were and they weighed a lot, and they were different sizes uh, depending on the on the scene. And um, I, you know, I know that I've seen images that suggested those lenses uh, are in somebody's possession. Well, I have to look it up again. I wasn't really trying to focus on that, but that would have been a really good thing to put in there. I would have, uh, I'll if I ever do this again, I'll put that in. I really like that question. Did, I'll look that the, up. The telephone, did he have anything that resembled a telephoto lens? Yeah, not, not like we, probably not like we think of telephoto lenses today. I would imagine uh, he had uh, equivalent of like on a 35 millimeter camera, like a 35 millimeter lens, a wide angle, he probably had a normal lens and he probably had a lens that would be equivalent to maybe, um, you know, like 70 to 80 millimeters. But I don't think he had, I think the lenses back then would have had to be enormous to be like 100 or 200 millimeters. And I don't think that any of his photographs, uh, most of them were fairly close in. So they were probably normal lenses, but they were very big and very heavy because they were made out of brass and heavy glass. And of course they had no shutters in them. They were just a big hunk of glass and the exposure was made by opening the back of the camera and exposing the plate. So um, yeah, I would imagine, I would imagine that if the wooden cameras didn't survive, the lenses probably would. Okay, there's a, there's a comment from Ron who says the Met has the only camera thought to be a Brady camera. Oh, really? Well, fabulous. Mm. The Met, the Met, the Met um, Museum. Yeah, I'm gonna have to look that up. I can tell you one thing though, I did find out is that that one image of Brady was a daguerreotype when he was a very young man. It was on an auction site that I happened to find 
and it was for sale for several thousand dollars. I mean, it was like an $8,000 item and they claimed there was only one made or one left. Because as I told you, many of these images got so damaged, you can see the damage in a lot of them. They got cracked, they got scratched. I mean, literally a slight movement across the image would just wipe it right off the plate. So um, the prints are the only ones that I think, um, you know, survived. And daguerreotypes didn't have prints. The daguerreotype was the only image. Could you, could you explain how the camera worked? I mean, you started to just before by- Yeah, the well, it was just, it was very, very simple. They had a very large, heavy wooden um, holder and inside the tent, they would take the glass, which is a piece of glass that he'd pour collodion on, which is a sticky substance, it would dry. They would then pour silver nitrate on it, which is a, the, the sensitive material. They would put that piece of glass inside this big, huge wooden holder, cover it up, take it out to the field, put it onto the back of the camera and secure it. The camera was already focused. And um, then there was no lens cap or anything. They would open up, they were ready for the shot. They would open up this wooden, wooden slide that would open up the back and the, and the, and the glass plate would be exposed to the image of the lens or the image that the lens would form on the back of the camera. And um, as you can imagine, everything had to be like screwed down very tight because these things weighed, you know, probably a couple hundred pounds and the slightest movements would have screwed it up. And the exposures were several seconds depending upon the amount of light. And they all guessed, they had no, they had no light meters, they just guessed. They said, well, it's a bright day, we'll expose it for 10 seconds. It might've been an overcast day, they'd expose it for 20 seconds if there was, you know, and then of course that would mean that anything moving would be blurred and uh, you couldn't see it. So it was very, very simple, but extremely clumsy. And um, all of it had to be done within minutes. You couldn't just take the plate that was exposed and put it in a special holder and take it back to the studio and do it. You had to do it within minutes because the chemistry required that you poured a developer onto it. So they're inside these tents with very dangerous chemicals um, and you know, pouring silver nitrate, some had hydrochloric acid. It was very, very dangerous and they got burns on their hands and it, it, they had to be very proficient at it and Brady taught them how to do it, but there was a lot of mistakes made and a lot of photographs were screwed up because they didn't do it right. So especially, you know, it's, one thing you're out in the field and everything is nice and sunny and beautiful and, and there's no movement, but you know, there's advancing armies and they had to suddenly pack up and leave. And as I mentioned, Brady's wagons got smashed, his photographs plates got cracked. Um, you know, it was, it was very difficult. And they were all undergoing change as the time went on. I mean, in other words, this was a, you know, a developing art uh, of photography. They were using what they called amber type prints. I didn't even mention tin types. They used those as well. That image was put on a piece of tin. Um, they had, you know, they had uh, albumin prints. Uh, all different kinds of techniques were used. And Brady used most of them. What did, they look, what did they look through? Did they look through the glass itself? Yeah, they had they had they had a screen in the back like a normal view camera does today that focused the image onto a black back of a screen, and that image was then focused onto that. Of course, it was upside down and backwards, and then they would put the holder. It was very much like a viewfinder in a camera today, and then you would put the big holder in there and then pull out the slide. Very very much like a, a an eight by ten view camera of today. So. Um, but it was, yeah, so, so yeah, they focused on the back of a screen. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty difficult. <laughs> it's amazing he got the photographs he did. And the quality, the quality. The quality was well, yeah, of course, they were very large in negatives. Okay, so um, unless anybody else has a question, and if you, and if you don't, want to type it and you just want to speak um we have about you know 
two minutes maybe to do that. Um, but if not, um, there's lots of good comments in the chat feature, Chris, and um, I wanna thank you um, for yet another wonderful photographic presentation. Um, and I wanna thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, I hope to see you at more of our, our programs. Um, we've got, I think, an exciting winter coming up um, or happening and um, have a good evening, everyone.